All right. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to this interview tonight. I know you must have had a very busy day, um, but congratulations on be being named one of four finalists for the National Teacher of the Year Award. So tell me how you're feeling. So I'm really, really excited. And you know, this, this is a great honor for me, but it's really a tribute to North Carolina and all the people we have that are doing great things for the kids in our classrooms. We have an incredible state board that is working toward ethical education and working on ways to continue improving our education. We have a new superintendent who is looking for ways to reach each one of our students and provide personalized education for each of our kids in classrooms. We have incredible teachers across our state who are working hard every single day to make connections and engage their kids and make sure their kids continue to learn despite all of the challenges that have been thrown at us with the pandemic. And it's just incredibly, it is an incredible honor that I have been selected to represent those teachers, those kids and our state at the national level. And I'm really excited to take the good things that we're doing in North Carolina and highlight those at the national level and share those out to help other states see some of the ways that we've turned some, some lemons into lemonade. Um, and I'm really excited to have a chance to do that and, and to highlight our state and all the amazing things we have going on here. Absolutely. Well, again, uh, congratulations. It's really what an, what an incredible honor. Um, you know, when we met in August, you were just kicking off your year as the North Carolina Teacher of the Year. And, you know, traditionally, those in that role crisscross the state visiting schools and, you know, giving speeches, um, going to events. Obviously, this year has been different. So tell us um, what it's been like, you know, what, what has this experience been like so far? given you are, you know, serving the state uh, during a pandemic? So this year's definitely looked different for me than it has for our previous teachers of the year, but it's also given me some opportunities to do some different things. So for instance, now, since most of the meetings that I'm, I'm going to are online and virtual, um, there was a, a day in December when I was able to go visit some schools in Edenton, North Carolina. And while I was driving there, I was able to be online for an NC forum, public school forum meeting. Um, and then coming back, I was able to join in for an educational policy fellows meeting. And normally, because those things would have been in person, if I would have taken the trip to the school, I would have missed out on those two meetings. But because I was able to join those virtually, I was able to still give the teacher perspective and explain how different programs and initiatives impact our kids in classrooms. And I still got to go visit the school. Um, it's also given us a chance as a team. So I am one of nine educators on the Regional Teachers of the Year team, and we represent all of the regions of our state, including charter schools. Um, we represent all different types of schools. So we have teachers that are from choice schools, alternative schools, traditional schools. We have middle school, high school, and elementary. We have a special education teacher. We have music and art teacher. So we, we kind of hit almost every area of kids and teachers that you can imagine in our state. And we have been able to launch a really awesome initiative that's called the Faces and Voices of Equity. And what we do is each month, we are examining a different facet of equity and we're deep diving into that with Twitter and Facebook chats to try to get some productive conversation going and try to identify some transformative solutions. Um, we also have been able to do some really cool interviews and some blogs and it's really been a phenomenal program. And I think had I been in the normal role of driving all around the state, we maybe wouldn't have come up with this awesome pro project that we've been able to collaborate on, but because we're all working remotely, it meant that we were able to dedicate time to finding some of those solutions to start tackling the barriers that our students have in education and identifying some of the different areas of equity that we're trying to bring to our state so that each one of our kids gets those equitable educational opportunities. That's great. Um, yeah, you know, the, there are definitely some silver linings in terms of just the, you know, making it easier to connect and thank goodness for technology during this time that we can be able to doing this interview face to face. Um, so I appreciate you lifting up those silver linings. Um, so tell us, you just kind of gave one initiative that you've been working on, um, but broadly, um, I know we talked about this back in August, but just for um, for everyone, kind of, what have you been focusing on? When you heard that you won the, you know, Teacher of the Year, um, what did you want to focus on this year? So my two main priorities this year were equity in education and social emotional learning. And I'd actually identified those as my two concentration areas prior to the pandemic. 
And then as the pandemic emerged, it became very, very critical to really concentrate on those two things. So the pandemic did bring to the surface a lot of inequities that educators had known were there all along, but now those have been highlighted to the public and in a much broader scale, we're able to see those inequities. And so now we have some real passion and we have a lot of, uh, a lot of our community members also helping us look for ways to address those inequities. I also really wanted to focus on social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. And you know, we do a fantastic job as educators teaching our kids the ABCs and the one, two, threes, but we also fill a critical role for our students in their social emotional learning. And so now with the pandemic, we realize that teachers are having to come up with some really unique ways to be able to connect with their students, to be able to check in on their students, and to be able to ensure that their students are doing okay socially and emotionally. And so I think that that has been another great area where I, I just unintentionally had thought that that was very important as a teacher. And then that ended up becoming one of the primary things that our team is really focusing on and trying to find some really good answers and trying to find some really good programs to help teachers to be able to highlight those social emotional learning skills in their curriculum and also connect with their kids, um, whether they're teaching in a blended, in a remote or in a face-to-face -face environment. Absolutely. Um, thank you for that. Uh, tell us, you know, prior to this new role, serving as North Carolina Teacher of the Year, you were teaching at Cumberland International Early College High School. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience and, and, you know, what it's like to teach at an early college. So it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, the kids that I teach are incredible and they are truly my inspiration. They're my motivation and they're the reason why I'm here today because they're just phenomenal. Um, and I've really enjoyed working with them. The kids that come to our early college, they're, they're motivated and they love to learn, but they're also really hard workers. And so it's really, as a teacher, it is such a joy to have an opportunity to work with kids that are, that are dedicated to their learning and are passionate about their learning and are engaged in their learning. And so it was truly an honor for me to have an opportunity to work with those kids and also to kind of see the world through their eyes. You know, it's really humbling when you step back as an adult and you kind of view the world through the eyes of teenagers. And I always joke that they keep me young because I got to stay on top of all my pop culture and know what's going on because I teach teenagers every day. And so um, they truly are incredible though. I am really excited for our country because I know that the kids that I have in my classroom are a microcosm of what we have nationwide. And the kids that we have in this generation are incredible. They have a lot of empathy. They're also very good at communicating with others. They're encouraged by looking at things through multiple viewpoints and multiple lenses. Mm -hmm. And they're warriors and they're ready to take on the challenges of the future. And so I am incredibly excited to be part of the, the core that is working to help prepare that next generation to take over as the next entrepreneurs and the next policymakers and the senators and congressmen and mayors and school teachers and everyone, you know, and so it's, it's really, it's really been fantastic to have an opportunity to teach as a high school teacher. Um, and it's, it's been my favorite thing I've ever done. You know, I say that teaching is my ikiga. So it's my purpose for being and my reason for being, and my kids are my ikiga too. And it's, it's just incredibly an honor to be able to be in a classroom every day and to be able to work with kids every day. Absolutely. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into teaching. I know that you were serving in the U.S. Air Force prior to um, becoming a teacher. So tell us kind of how that prior experience has influenced your teaching and, and really what made you want to be a teacher in the first place. So if you would have asked me when I was in high school or even as I was graduating from college, if I was going to be a teacher, my answer probably would have been no. Um, but when my oldest son was in kindergarten, his teacher needed parent volunteers to come in and help in his classroom. And so I started going in um, during my lunch break or when I could stop by. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that I had a real knack for working with the kids that didn't quite get it in whole group instruction. So those kids who just needed a little bit of extra help or someone to kind of give them a guiding hand to kind of help them through things. And I also found it was incredible to see a kid who on Monday was struggling to sound out a word. And when I would come back on Wednesday, they could do it. And that was really amazing to see those kids and their excitement as they were able to master that task or that concept. 
And as I continued to volunteer through that year, I was like, you know what? I love this. Like, I am so excited to come into this kindergarten classroom a couple times a week and see these kids and check and see how they're doing and be there to help them. And, you know, like I would run into them at the commissary at the PX and they would run over and hug me and their parents would be like, who is this woman who they are running over and hugging? But I really started making those connections and having that, that experience of building those relationships with those kids. And so um, I was at the point where I was transitioning out of the Air Force. And so I went into the education office at Laughlin Air Force Base, which is where we were stationed. And um, I talked to them about my options and they put me on the path for troops to teachers. Um, and Del Rio is a very, very small town. And so there wasn't a university there. So they also told me about Western Governors University, which at the time was a brand new concept of online school. Um, and so I was able to start using the mentorship program through Troops to Teachers. And then I was also able to get into WGU and begin my path to, toward being an educator. And I haven't looked back since. I, 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 when I changed my career, I changed to my passion and my calling. And education is truly my calling. And I am so happy that I volunteered in that kindergarten classroom when my son was a little tiny guy. He's now a senior in college. That tells you how long ago it was. Um, but that I had the opportunity to take that volunteer experience because that is what gave me the desire and the passion and lit the fire for me to become an educator. Absolutely. And, and so how has that experience in the Air Force, um, you know, I know you are a science and biology teacher, kind of how do you, do you weave in your experience to your lessons? Kind of tell us a little bit more about how um, that career influenced your teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my undergraduate degree is in biology from the Air Force Academy. So I did have formal training in biology. Mm -hmm. And um, as I started emerging into a teacher, I, I knew that it would be really important for me to tell some of those stories from the military because the kids love to hear the stories, you know. So I do weave quite a bit of my experience from getting to travel around the world or being able to tell them different stories about silly things that happened with my airmen or, you know, a funny story of something that we did when we were on an air transport going across the ocean. And they, they love that. They, they love to hear all those stories. But what I didn't realize is that when I, when I graduated from college, I was assigned as an intelligence officer. And as an intel officer, I was giving briefings and I was taking data and information and putting it into formats that I was able to then explain or disseminate to pilots or to commanders and to different people on the base who needed that intelligence information. At the time, I didn't realize it, but that was the perfect segue for me to become a teacher because that's essentially what I do today. I take information and then I figure out a way to present it to my kids so that they understand it. I'm constantly changing the way that I'm teaching based on my students' needs and how they need to hear it so that they're able to learn it. And I'm coming up with ways to make it so that that information is applicable and relevant to them. And so while I didn't even realize it at the time, being an intelligence officer was preparing me for my next career as a teacher. Um, and I do fall back on a lot of those skills uh, all the time. You know, it's learning how to speak in front of people, learning how to disseminate information, learning how to tailor information for my audience. Um, I use all of those skills every day as a teacher. Yeah, expand on that a little bit. I know um, in your application, um, both I think for the State Teacher of the Year and also for the National Teacher of the Year, um, that you use, you know, you talk about using data to inform your teaching, kind of how you use the EVOS data um, to really inform your teaching. Tell us a little bit uh, more about how you do that. Absolutely. So um, I use projection data that we get from the state initially, and that projection data is based off of how students have done historically. So it takes a look at how they've done on their science end of grade tests in seventh and sixth, seventh and eighth grade. It goes back to elementary school and takes a look at their fifth grade test. And then based on how they've done historically, I'm able to get a projection or an idea of how they're expected to do in earth and environmental science, chemistry and biology at the high school level. So I use that information initially before my students ever even walk into my classroom to identify kids, to see if there's anyone that I can kind of get like a, a early read on that they might need a little bit of extra help or a little bit of extra assistance. And in our program at the early college, we're a choice school. So we get kids from all the middle schools across our county, which so like sometimes if you have a direct line, like if you're at a middle school and then you, all the, those students then go on to a high school, 
the teacher at the high school level has a really good idea of what that middle school teacher taught because the, she gets the same students every year from that teacher. In my case, though, I'm getting kids from all over our county. And so some of the students had strong middle school teachers who really, you know, really embraced teaching science and did hands on learning. Some of my kids, though, were coming from situations where they had a substitute teacher the entire school year. And so they were a little, struggling a little bit with some of the science concepts. And so by getting that initial projection data, I was able to identify the kids who were going to need some extra help on the very first day they walked into my classroom. Now, the kids had no idea I was doing this, but I was looking at that data and then I would pull kids who I knew I, I had identified as what we would call tier one, meaning that, that they, they need a little bit of extra assistance. I would pull those kids and I would work with them one on one in the early days of our class to kind of get an idea of was the because sometimes the data is off. Sometimes you have a kid that just doesn't test well and that's not really indicative of what they understand in science. It's just that they didn't do good on the test. And so I would kind of pull them and kind of get an idea of where they were. Then as we begin moving into the school year, I'm collecting data on every single thing my kids are doing. So if we're having a class discussion, I'm collecting data. If we have a quiz, I'm collecting data. If they're doing uh, doodle notes or a foldable or anything that we did, I was collecting data to see how well they understood the concepts that we were going over. When I identified a student who was struggling in any area, I would immediately pull them for one-on-one -on -one remediation or small group remediation to readdress that concept and reteach it. And when my students would come in for tutoring, I would do the same thing. I would look at where they were struggling and I would tailor the tutoring lessons to them. And then I also would tailor my lessons each week for them. So if I have 75 students, I have 75 lesson plans because each one of those kids needs something a little bit different from me to be successful in science. And using that system, I was able to have some great success for my kids. And they responded to the way that I was teaching them phenomenally. And so we normally each year we were projected to be at about 50% proficiency on our um, end of course exams and at our school for the past, I think like four years, we have been above 92% each year. And so I think that that demonstrates the importance of using that data, not as a gotcha, but using the data as a way to inform instruction. So you use it to see where your kids are and see what your kids need and then use that data to personalize instruction so it meets the unique needs of every single kid in your classroom. And when you do that, you can work magic for your kids. Yeah, I'm curious, um, you know, knowing how important that data is for you. Um, you know, I'm curious, I know there's a debate right now around like, do you do standardized tests this year? Do you not? You know, and people are arguing both sides. And I'm curious kind of what you think about that. So I, I have always thought that standardized tests are important because they do give us information on how students are learning. Mm -hmm. um, I do not like it when we use standardized tests, though, to say that a teacher is not doing a good job or a student is not proficient on an individual level. But I think when we use them kind of at a, a macro level, it does help us determine whether or not the way that we're teaching kids is successful. Um, I think it's important that we do use that data for our kids because, especially in this year, because we have some, some school districts in North Carolina that are in plan A with their elementary kids and plan B or plan C with their high school and middle school kids. We have some schools that are in plan B for all of their grade levels. We have some schools that are in plan C for all their grade levels. And then we have some that are like a mixture of A, B, and C across their, their district. And so you know, this year especially, I think it's going to be really important that as our students begin coming back into our classrooms, that we have a way to measure exactly where they are so that we're able to design that instruction and personalize the instruction to meet them exactly where they are. Um, I know this is something that Superintendent Truitt is focused on. She is also a, uh, a she also thinks that data driven instruction is incredibly important and her team is working to help identify ways that we can proactively work with our students so that we're able to identify if they have any gaps in learning and we can design instruction that meets those gaps so that we're able to help our kids be on track for where they need to be to be successful when they exit our pre-k-12 systems and I, I think that that's definitely something that we can do 
Um, I also think that those standardized tests, though, are important because it helps prepare our kids. So our students will have to take the ACT and SAT if they are college bound. And when they get to college, they are going to have to take final exams. And many times those are multiple choice, very similar to the standardized tests that we take in our, our K-12 system. So I think it's important that we are using those same kind of assessment tools to measure our kids in the K-12 system because it helps prepare them when they get into college so that they're ready to take those tests. The very first standardized test I ever took in my entire life was the SAT my junior year in high school. And I didn't do good. <laughs> I had to take it eight wow. times to get the score that I wanted to get into the Air Force Academy. Wow. So I think had I been in a system where I was a little bit better practiced at answering those mm -hmm. multiple choice questions and understanding some of the test taking strategies. And if I had been in a situation ever where there was kind of a hard stop, like, OK, now it's time to stop taking the test. You have to put your pencil down. I wouldn't have, I would have done better, I think, on those initial times that I took the SAT. And I think that, that that is one of the advantages for our students is that they're better prepared to take those college entrance exams. And they're also better prepared to take the test once they arrive in college. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, so, you know, I know there'll be a little bit of time before you uh, find out if you are selected as the National Teacher of the Year, but um, if you are selected, what do you hope to accomplish in that role? So I have had great success with the team that we have with the regional teachers of the year. So with the nine of us, you know, somebody, I have like kind of an idea and I bring it up to them. And by the end of an hour long meeting, we have this like knock it out of the park idea because I have the input of eight other educators that are extraordinary and passionate and have just phenomenal ideas. And so one of the things that I would really love to do if I am the National Teacher of the Year is to build on the, that network, but at the national level. So, you know, I was thinking, I was talking to somebody about the schools we have over in the Western part of the state and they were trying to explain the Appalachian Mountains to me. And I was like, no, I got it. I grew up in West Virginia. I know exactly what you're talking about. And that's when it kind of hit me that, you know, we would have a lot in common with Georgia and Tennessee and West Virginia, because we're all in that kind of Appalachian mountain range. And then we would have a lot in common with South Carolina and Virginia for our coastal regions. And, um, you know, Florida would have a lot in common with Louisiana. And so I just was kind of thinking, I'm like, wow, you know, we, we could really solve some problems by saying, okay, well, what are you guys doing in your mountain regions for internet? Like, we're really struggling to get internet to those kids and remote learning. How are you guys doing that? And if West Virginia or Tennessee or Georgia has come up with a great idea, then North Carolina can say, we love that. Can we borrow that idea? And I think that, you know, that communication would help us be able to take some of the barriers and some of the challenges that we face in education and really find those solutions because we would be working together across state lines to try to find some of those different solutions. And I think, you know, there, there would be a lot to be gained if we start asking people from multiple perspectives. Hey, can you give us your viewpoint? Hey, what do you think about this? I have this idea and I, what, what do you think? Like, what could we do with it? I really think that we could have some amazing solutions to a lot of the problems we're currently facing in public education because we'd be working together to benefit all of the kids in our classrooms nationwide. Absolutely. Well, um, I wish you luck and uh, we will, I know I'll be uh, waiting excitedly to, to find out who is selected. Um, my last question is really, uh, you know, this has been a really tough year um, for students, families, and educators. Um, what words of advice do you have for your students and your peers? Um, what is giving you hope at this moment in time? So I think the most important thing to remember is that you're not alone. Um, I had an opportunity to work with several other teachers of the year from North Carolina on a blog series where we looked at student caregiver and teacher mental health. And one of the things that we really wanted to kind of highlight and acknowledge is that we all have bad days and we all have days right now where we're feeling like we didn't connect with our kids or like nobody asked you a question that zoom or you only had three of your 20 students log in for something. And I think the important thing to remember is that we all are having those days and teachers are doing an incredible job. Teachers are, they, we were literally told on a Saturday that on Monday we had to completely change the way that we had taught for our entire careers and nobody complained, they just did it. They literally turned on a dime and switched instruction to being remote. 
And I think that that shows the passion for teachers. I think that shows the dedication that teachers have to their students. I think it shows how much teachers have their heart in their kids in an education. Because every single one of those kids that has been in your classroom since the very first day you taught etches on your heart. And I know that teachers right now are struggling to work to make sure they are reaching those kids, to make sure their kids are learning, to make sure they're engaging their kids. And I want them to know that we hear them and that we know that it is difficult and we are so proud of them, but we are also here with them. And I, I understand the frustrations and I understand how difficult it can be. And I want them to know that they are appreciated and that they are not alone. Thank you. I, I appreciate those words. And I know that, um, you know, our students and our educators across the state will appreciate them as well. So that's really um, all the questions I have. But is there anything that I haven't asked about that you want to make sure we talk about? No, I just want to say how incredibly proud I am that I'm having an opportunity to represent our state at the national level. We are doing some phenomenal things in education in North Carolina, and I am incredibly proud of the equity resolution that we passed in the fall. Um, I'm very proud that we are moving forward on getting those social study standards passed. And I, I know that our state has done some really incredible things. And it is such an honor for me to be able to take those positive things and amazing things that we're doing in education to the national level and to be able to share those out and show people how incredible the state of North Carolina is and why I'm proud to be a North Carolinian.